In 1997, Wizards of the Coast purchased the near-bankrupt TSR, releasing the third edition of Dungeons & Dragons in August of 2000. Three months later, having acquired the Star Wars license, a new Star Wars RPG hit the shelves, written by former D6 designer Bill Schlavasek, apologies if I mispronounced that, Andy Collins, and J.D. Whitker. This new version would incorporate the D20 system used in D&D 3rd edition. It's important to bear in mind that the system is still relatively young, and the sourcebook explosion from both first and third party we'd see in a few years, that I've called the OGL bubble, hadn't taken hold just yet at this time. Two years later, a revised edition of the book was released to coincide with the recent Episode 2 hitting theaters. However, the revised edition would only last about two years. After the release of Ultimate Adversaries, they put the line on hold and focused on the better-selling at the time miniatures game instead. This was partially due to their deal with Lucasfilm limiting how many books they could release annually. It is this revised version that will be the focus of this review, largely for the same reasons I stuck with the re revised and expanded second edition previously. It's the most complete look at the game's mechanics and how things will work out for this era. But to differentiate it from the Star Wars D20 game we'll be covering later, we'll be calling this one just Star Wars Revised. Now, Star Wars Revised Edition is a fairly unpopular game in some circles, some even propping it up as yet another example of how the prequels ruined everything. But what's my take on it? Well, let's find out. For the most part, the layout here is the quality I'd expect from most Wizards games, that being fairly solid. The color scheme is much more muted than previously, and there's more original art than film stills. However, it does have some of Wizards' quirks as well like the odd placement at times with their charts, or having prestige classes in the GM section, and having feats being somewhat disorganized. More importantly, I think the lightish blue they chose for the page background was a bad idea. It can blend way too easily with black text. All I'm saying is a little bit of contrast is your friend. This game uses a similar setup to D&D, but far more streamlined. There's very little in the way of spell-like effects in this case, and even force powers are governed by skills and feats. For the sake of consistency, we'll be going with a similar setup to last time as best we can, making a young Jedi type character. The first step is generating abilities. Technically you're supposed to pick a species first, but since abilities are the crux of the character, that's what's getting rolled first. There are six ability scores to be generated. Strength, Dexterity, Constitution, Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma. Each ability score will create a modifier to rolls using it that equals the ability score minus 10 and divided by half. Because I'm a traditionalist, I'll be using the random generation approach of rolling 4d6 and adding the three highest. After repeating this six times, we assign each roll to one of the ability scores. This gives us the following scores as a result. Strength 18, Dexterity 12, Constitution 15, Intelligence 16, Wisdom 11, and Charisma 8. The second step is choosing a species, and adjusting accordingly for its features. In this case, we'll be going with Human, which grants us the following benefits. Four extra skill points at first level, and one extra feat. You would think it would do the plus two to one attribute like it does with D&D, but strangely, no. Next comes the most important step, choosing a class. This time around, of the two Jedi classes, we'll be going with Jedi Guardian instead of Jedi Counselor. At level one, this gives us the following traits. 1d10 vitality points, 32 skill ranks to spend on the Jedi Guardian's class skills, the following feats, exotic weapon proficiency, lightsaber, force sensitive, Weapon Group Proficiency, Blaster Pistols, and Weapon Group Proficiency, Simple Weapons. One Bonus Force Feat, the Deflect Class Feature, plus one to Base Attack, plus three to Defense, plus two to Fortitude Saves, plus two to Reflex Saves, plus one to Will Saves, plus one to Reputation, a Lightsaber, and 1,000 Credits. Placing all that into the character sheet, as well as calculating the finishing touches for equipment, saves, and bonuses, we have the following results. For skills, we have four ranks in the following. Crafting, Jump, Listen, Repair, Spot, Battle Mind, Force Defense, and Heal Self. For our Force feat, we picked Control, and we picked Metal as our bonus feat. When spending credits on equipment, we picked an all-temperature cloak, a med pack, five energy cells, and a blaster pistol. One major issue I have is how the classes are designed. It's very toned down regarding class abilities, most of which are just improvements on ones you'd get for your first six levels. Beyond that, abilities are too situational for this type of game. Making this small ability pool all the worse is the fact that you are expected to have a prestige class. But even the prestige classes don't help much in this regard because a lot of them are using abilities that D&D characters might get at the start. Furthermore, many of the feats and some of the equipment is just a plus two bonus to a specific thing, and the rest of them are very much copy-pasted from 3rd edition. Situational bonuses alone are, in my opinion, insufficient towards making a character feel distinct throughout a campaign. 
if I could pin this down to anything, it's that in streamlining a lot of the character development, they ended up swinging the pendulum too far the other way. When most classes have up to five abilities throughout their entire run at best, there's a problem. Once again, this game uses the D20 system, and as such retains its core mechanic of D20 plus modifiers versus a difficulty class number. If your total beats the DC, you succeed. Natural 20s are an automatic success, and natural 1s are an automatic failure. The proverbial monkey wrench in this case is its use of the Force. First, Force points here are not too far removed from action points in, say, Eberron. By spending one, you gain a set of extra die to roll along with the d20. In a nice touch to the lore, you can gain more die from dark side points, but gain too many of those and your character becomes corrupted. Like in d6, Force use is a skill, specifically a set of skills tied to Control, Sense, and Alter from before. Force feats allow for more advanced uses of Force abilities, with a cost of vitality to represent the toll on one's stamina from using these powers. I'm fine with this, but others have done it far better. Revised uses a vitality and wound system instead of standard hit points, the former being minor damage you can shrug off, and the latter being more serious damage to contend with. This seems to be a reasonable idea, except when you peek under the hood. For starters, armor. Instead of adding to your defense like in D&D, or armor class technically, but let's not split hairs, it grants damage reduction to your wounds, meaning it's only going to be effective after you've taken some hints or against criticals, which target wounds directly in this case. Worse, heavier armor still has penalties to dexterity, which you need for a good defense. Add in the fact that even a standard blaster pistol is going to do 3d8 damage, and you've got characters who can take a few hits at best. And to further twist the knife, lightsabers ignore damage reduction and scale with level in the hands of a Jedi, leading to ridiculous scenarios where a Jedi could insta-kill you with just one crit. As much as I criticize the combat a bit in D6 for being a bit clunky with its lethality, I would take that over this case where a well-placed role can mean the difference between success and disaster. This comes off a bit swingy to me, and I'm not a fan of that sort of mechanic. I treat it the same way that NES hard can sometimes mean surprise difficulty that you have to memorize. I'm not a fan of that. Look, I am fully aware of my reputation as the guy who defends unpopular works, ranging from video games to movies to even other RPGs. So one would think I'd be willing to be the devil's advocate for this too, given how much hate it gets. Now, while I don't possess the level of hatred that some have for this version, because I'm not a hateful guy, I am not defending this either. If I were to sum up Revised in one term, it would be that it feels like a prototype, a playtest version. It's trying very hard to be D&D meets Star Wars, but is unwilling to bend the D20 system to accommodate the style of play that's inherent to Star Wars. Without a real post-mortem, it's really hard to tell how long Revised was developed. But I would not be surprised if it was only three or so months, given how so much of it feels like a Diet Coke version of the D20 system. If this was to try and emulate the simplicity in D6, that's admirable, but misguided. It also highlights how D20 is not the universal approach that so many people thought it was, but I'm getting ahead of myself. D20, by its core approaches, is not based on simplicity like D6 was. It prides itself on customization and a deep crunch. Trying to be both at once is something that can only succeed at pissing off both. It was clear that it needed more time to cook, to adapt the rules to better serve this new system instead of trying to carry over the ideas from its predecessor. As an aside, I do find it funny that 4th edition was accused of over-streamlining when so many of the classes in this game are so sparse and lacking in features or content. Because of these shortcomings and more, Revised is the only game in this series that I would stamp with Avoid. It's been out of print for some time, and most of the things it brought to the table were done far better elsewhere. But fret not, for there is a light at the end of this tunnel. After Revised was shelved in 2004, its successor would wait about three years before Star Wars and D20 would get a new band together to say, We can rebuild it. We have the technology. Creating the Saga system in June of 2007. But that is a tale for another day.